Okay, so this is the IQC Quicks Math and Computer Science Seminar. And today we are very pleased to have Nolan Coble from the University of Maryland, who is going to speak about divide and conquer method for approximating output probabilities of geometrically local shallow depth quantum circuits. Great, great, thanks, Carl. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this talk is based on a joint work with Matthew Kudron, um, which we develop a classical divide and conquer algorithm for this task. Uh, now, typical divide and conquer algorithms, uh, you have a problem um, and you're going to divide this problem into typically two smaller problems of the same type. You are going to recursively solve them and recombine. Um, so this is the approach that we hope to take uh, with these geometrically local shallow depth quantum circuits. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem possible to uh, do this and achieve low error with only one division step. Uh, so this complicates things greatly. And so the purpose of this talk is really to um, get into the methods behind this like multi-division step of this algorithm. All right, so the problem statement, uh, I haven't really defined these words yet, but I will in a little bit. Uh, let's see, be a geometrically local shallow depth quantum circuit, which acts on n qubits. And our goal is going to be to compute the probability of measuring some bit string x after we prepare the state C on the all zeros. And so this is, of course, the uh, exact same quantity as uh, the amplitude squared of this X um, state. And so our task is going to be um, not to compute this exactly, but to compute it to some additive error epsilon. And so now we're asked, what is the classical complexity of computing this output probability within epsilon in the worst case? Uh, in particular, that is, uh, what can we guarantee a runtime and a error for all such circuits um, with arbitrary two qubit gates? All right, uh, so some quick overview of, I'm going to first talk about the motivation, uh, some preliminaries uh, for the method. Uh, for the technical portion of the talk, I will be talking about this linear combination lemma from our paper. Um, unfortunately, that's not quite enough to get the divide and conquer step. So I'll be talking about some remaining approximations and then how this works in a 3D algorithm. Us, okay, so 1D geometrically local. Uh, what I have drawn here is a, um, you can see a line of qubits. Uh, the geometric locality in this case means that we can only apply two qubit gates to nearest neighbors in this line. Um, so I guess when I have these circuits drawn, I have the input on the bottom and the output on the top. Uh, when I say shallow depth, what I mean is that for an n qubit line, uh, the depth is order of log n um, or poly log n. Uh, so for this case, the task of approximating output probabilities of 1D uh, geometrically local shallow circuits uh, can be done efficiently with inverse polynomial error using well-known matrix product state algorithms. Um, which, of course, I'm not going to really have time to talk about it all today. Um, and though I drew this circuit with uh, the so-called brickwork architecture, um, there's no reason for that. Uh, the circuits we consider in ours are um, general. So what does 2D geometrically local look like? Well, in this case, you now have a two-dimensional grid of qubits, um, and you can act again with uh, nearest neighbors in this two-dimensional grid. Um, and the task is again the same. What is the output probability of some bit string? Uh, you'll notice that for um, these circuit diagrams, there's always um, spatial dimensions and then a depth dimension. Uh, so you see that this uh, 2D geometrically local ends up being a three-dimensional picture. Um, so one thing to note is uh, just recently, um, last year, maybe two years ago, uh, Sergey Bravi, David Gossett, and Ramis Movasa gave a um, efficient classical algorithm to handle this exact case um, to inverse polynomial error. Unfortunately, it's unclear how to extend their results to three dimensions without an exponential blow up. And so this is what really um, forced us to pursue a more novel approach to the problem for three dimensions. Uh, and what could this look like? Uh, well, again, since there's uh, an additional depth dimension, we are unfortunately not able to draw a four dimensional circuit diagram. Uh, so you have to use your imagination a little bit. But um, the idea is that our qubits lie on a cubic lattice of n qubits. Um, and then the depth dimension is, again, uh, shallow, so order log n. 
And so the result from our paper is a divide and conquer classical algorithm that runs in quasi polynomial time and can solve um, the problem of estimating the output probabilities through inverse polynomial error. Um, are there any questions up to this point? Okay. I had one question just about um, the general problem itself. So if you're approximating up to inverse polynomial error, so that, um, and you have a, an exponential number of possible outputs. So am I right to infer that we're essentially focusing on high probability outputs, ones that are especially likely to occur? Yep, yeah, exactly. I'll talk about that, I think, in a couple slides. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely true. Um, you're going to need um, this circuit, if there is some bit string that has um, output probability inverse polynomial, then there has to be something special about the circuit um, to satisfy this property. Um, yeah, I talk about this in a, uh, briefly in a couple other slides. Okay. All right. So um, just quickly mentioning a relation to sampling problems, um, which we think we had a talk on a couple of weeks ago. Um, sampling is uh, we're asked to output a bit string according to the probability distribution defined by this circuit. Uh, so our task is different. Um, it is not to output a sample. Instead, it's to simply compute this um, probability. Uh, of course, sampling um, in the regime of inverse polynomial error, uh, sampling uh, is able to also achieve this task of estimating output probabilities. Um, if you could sample from this uh, uh, probability distribution, uh, then you just need a polynomial number of samples to estimate this quantity uh, to inverse polynomial error. All right, so uh, why might this problem be interesting? Uh, well, another recent result by uh, Ramiz Movasa just a couple of years ago said in the worst case, it's actually sharp p hard to compute the uh, output probabilities to uh, two to the negative n squared error. Uh, so this essentially means we can only really hope to solve the problem uh, when epsilon is a lot larger than this. Uh, and so like uh, Carl mentioned just a little bit ago, for random circuits, uh, these output probabilities are typically uh, inverse exponential, uh, whereas in this work, we're considering inverse polynomial. And so of course, this is going to imply some special properties about the circuit, um, which I mentioned one of them in particular that we utilize in the paper. Um, so why should we care about this error regime? Um, for starters, we believe it to be uh, relevant for classically simulating some hybrid quantum algorithms. Um, so this would be the case. Um, a lot of algorithms um, that do this uh, consist of some geometrically local shallow quantum circuit combined with some classical post-processing -process stuff. Um, this is a pretty common framework for hybrid algorithms. Um, and so such classical algorithms um, we can that these uh, simulation algorithms can simulate. Uh, is the case where the um, classical post-processing is an all AND gate on the output bits, um, an all OR gate, or an all XOR gate. Um, and this is just by simple tricks that relate the circuit C to another new geometrically local circuit. All right, uh, so a couple notes. Um, we only need to actually solve the problem for the output probability of the zero bit string. Uh, the reason behind this is because, uh, again, one of these tricks, we can essentially um, subsume the task of uh, preparing this X into the circuit. And this is still geometrically local and shallow depth. Uh, so we're actually only going to consider the case of um, estimating the zero output probability. All right, so in our paper, uh, we consider 3D geometrically local, um, since that's the first one that hasn't really been approached, um, at least not below exponential runtime. Uh, but in this talk, I'm really gonna be discussing the methods uh, framed in terms of 1D geometrically local circuits. Uh, really, this is only for visual sake. Uh, there's really no difference between the 1D and the 3D, um, but that's sort of like where the end of my talk ends up is how these like methods I described in 1D can kind of just like lift up to three dimensions. Uh, and then lastly, some notes. Um, I mentioned before the algorithm has a divide and conquer structure. Um, so in this case, if you imagine we have a one dimensional line of qubits, um, we're eventually going to divide down until our um, circuit has only constant width. Uh, in this case, um, I say the base case will contain circuits in one fewer dimension. So in our paper, when we look at three dimensional geometrically local, uh, the base case is actually 2D geometrically local. 
Um, and so for our algorithm, we actually take you, uh, advantage of that BGM algorithm for 2D circuits uh, to solve our problem in the base case. And then lastly, sort of a disclaimer, I'm not actually going to be giving you um, the algorithm. It's pretty involved. Um, it's in the paper if you wanna see it. I'm really just discussing here the theory behind the single divide and conquer step for the algorithm. All right, so are there any questions on the first part? All right, so getting into some preliminaries, uh, the first notion we'll need is that of a light cone. Uh, it looks like, um, okay, so the first notion we need is that of a light cone. Um, so I'm going to uh, select some subset of qubits A. Um, I colored them green, but I'm realizing now that it's very close to black, um, but it's these five qubits here in the center. Um, so the light cone of A, um, it consists of gates. Uh, we say that a gate is in the light cone of the set of qubits A if there is a sequence of overlapping gates that uh, reach back to A. Uh, so for instance, this gate in the upper left here, um, you notice it does not act on any qubits in A, but there is an overlapping sequence that eventually gets back to A. And so um, one way to intuitively think about this is that the light cone of the qubits uh, is all the qubits that are affected by uh, gates in this set A. Um, often I'll interchangeably refer to the gates in the light cone um, as the same as the qubits in the light cone. Um, intuitively, I think that should just probably makes sense. Um, next, we have the idea of a reverse light cone. So this is the exact opposite. Uh, instead of looking at the input, we look at the output and we look for a sequence of gates leading to the output. Um, so again, this uh, gate does not act on A, but there are a sequence of gates that eventually bring it back to A. Uh, intuition behind this reverse light cone is it's all of the gates that ultimately affect the output on A. Um, so if you uh, think of it sort of from a physics perspective of an observable acting on these A qubits, uh, the only part of this whole circuit that affects this observable are the gates in the reverse light cone of A. And so in some ways, this reverse light cone captures all of the information about how the circuit acts on a, some, sub, some subset of qubits. Right, and the motivation behind using light cones, um, specifically for geometrically local and shallow depth circuits, is that if this subset of qubits A is uh, a polylogarithmic number, then the light cone does not grow more than that. Um, so if we have you know, n qubits in our line, then the light cone of a small number of qubits, again, only affects a large, or only hits a large, a small number of qubits. Um, so in, in this sense, you have an exponential, or a uh, exponentially smaller number of qubits in the light cone. Right. Um, so we're gonna introduce some notation. Um, so again, we're given this- Right, um, Nolan, can I ask a quick question about that? Um, if you just go back one slide, is, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so I think you said that your notion of shallow depth here is um, like polylog depth. Mm -hmm. But is this true if, if the circuit has polylog depth? Because um, don't you get a blow up which is like constant to the depth of the circuit? Uh, oh, I see. Oh, because it's geometrically local. Oh, I see. Geometrically local. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so each each gate effectively will move out one depth. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, thanks a lot. Yeah, so I guess like I should say it's, um, if this is some function, then this is depth times the function. Got it, thank you. Yep. All right, so yeah, some notation for slicing the circuit. Um, we're going to uh, consider a slice to be three regions, uh, B, M, and F, which I've colored here in orange, magenta, and orange. Um, and then all the remaining uh, qubits to the left of this are called L and the remaining qubits to the right are called R. And we're gonna choose the widths of these regions so that L and R are light cones separated from M. Uh, so what this means is if you look at the light cone of M, the light cone of L and the light cone of R, uh, notice I've chosen the widths of these regions so that these light cones don't overlap with each other. Uh, this is an important notion. Um, note from the previous slide, the fact that these light cones don't grow too large 
means that a slice that has this property that it like cone separates L, M, and R uh, will also not be too wide um, in the case that we're looking for a polylogarithmic size M. All right. So now I'm going to talk about some subcircuits of our circuit C. Um, so at this slice BMF, we're going to let C BMF to know all of the gates in the reverse light cone of M. Um, so that I have here call it in magenta. Uh, and then the remaining gates to the left and right will just be called CL and CR. Um, so CL consists of these orange gates and these blue ones, and CR is these orange gates and the red ones. Um, an important property is that um, our circuit C can be decomposed using these. Um, first, we apply CBMF, and then we apply CL and CR. I note the order is important. Um, we are able to apply uh, this circuit CBMF first, uh, but we can't apply any of the gates here specifically on the edge of CL and CR um, before we apply these gates. Um, and that's, again, this is, has to do with uh, the notion of this reverse light cone, which is why we can do this. Um, next, C wrap will consist of all the gates that are in the light cone of BMF that are not in CBMF. So that's all of these orange gates. Uh, and then just notationally, the ones to the left are CL wrap, the ones to the right are CR wrap. And then the remaining gates, I'm just going to label these, but um, you can pretty much ignore these two definitions. They're just there for technicality. All right. Uh, so are there any questions on these subcircuits? Um, so the first idea uh, we're going to look at is uh, we're going to consider the state psi, which is the state prepared by CBMF on the zero register and then post selected on the M register. Um, so I said before that uh, the reverse light cone captures essentially all the information about a uh, subset of qubits. So the state CBMF uh, is essentially um, captures the state of the circuit um, on the register uh, M. Uh, now, post-selecting on M, we are still going to have information on registers B and F, and this psi B union F is uh, representative of the information of, um, across the cut. Uh, one thing to note is that if we consider the zero state tensored with this uh, psi B union F, then the quantity zero all C zero all is exactly equal to this quantity on the left. Um, I use Z zero all to refer to the zero state on the unmeasured qubits. It should usually be clear from notation what those are. Um, so the first idea behind um, or hint at maybe a divide and conquer algorithm is to consider the Schmidt decomposition of the state side B union F. Uh, so we have Schmidt uh, coefficients lambda I and then Schmidt vectors VI on the B register and WI on the F register. Uh, in this case, uh, I showed before, this is the quantity that we're looking for. Um, if we use the Schmidt de decomposition, uh, we can see that we now have uh, a sum over a product of terms. Um, in this left-hand product, we have a circuit CL, uh, and on the right product, we have the circuit CR. Uh, now you'll know if we were to choose the slice that we're looking at in the very center of our 1D line of qubits, then the circuit CL acts on about half of the number of qubits of the original, and the circuit CR also acts on about half the original number. Um, so this would be great. Um, we could uh, hopefully look to approximate these quantities and use this uh, summation as our divide and conquer step. Uh, unfortunately, there are some problems with this. Um, it's not clear um, how we could construct these Schmidt coefficients and vectors with geometrically local shallow depth quantum circuits. Um, this would of course be important for a divide and conquer algorithm because we want our problems we produce to be of the same type um, as our previous problem. Another consideration is I've drawn this summation to have uh, polynomially many terms. Uh, it's not clear why the state should have most of its weight on a few Schmidt coefficients. Um, so both of these problems um, we're not able to solve in full generality. Uh, but it turns out that we can at least produce the top Schmidt coefficients onto these top Schmidt vectors. Um, so I say here, we don't actually end up solving the problem by it, these equations. Uh, we're forced to pursue um, a more complicated way of constructing our, um, our quantity. All right, so 
um, to do this. I mentioned before, we're going to need multiple division steps. Um, so instead of considering one slice, we're gonna consider um, omega n evenly spaced slices. Um, so this uh, black bar is supposed to represent the 1D line of qubits. And each of these like little sections is representative of these slices. Um, we define CBMF sub i in the exact same way as CBMF. Uh, CLI and CRI represent all the qubits to the left and to the right of a cut. And CRAP i is also defined analogously as before. Um, we now, since we have multiple uh, cuts, we're going to also introduce uh, CI sub j. Uh, this is essentially all of the gates that lie between two cuts. Um, so I said before, um, at a single slice, we can decompose our circuit into CBMF at i, composed with the remainder of the left and the right. Uh, but now at two slices, we can do this again. So we end up having uh, the CBMI or CBMF on site I and site J. Uh, and then we can apply the remainder of the gates to recover our whole circuit. All right, any questions on this um, multiple slices notation? All right, so I mentioned uh, earlier that a circuit that has um, output probabilities greater than inverse polynomial must have some special property. Um, and this is uh, one such example. Um, so it turns out if we look in an interval of length log to the seventh n qubits, then we can find at least log n. Just let me just put it in the game. Uh, what? Oh, but yeah. Okay, so yeah, in every interval of length log to the seventh n qubits, there are at least log n slices which satisfy their top Schmidt coefficients, are um, inverse uh, poly logarithmically close to one. Um, we're going to denote the set of slices that satisfy this equation to be k heavy, uh, and we're, we'll typically consider delta heavy slices. Um, so delta just being some variable of slices. Uh, so yeah, the idea here is um, we have our set of slices on n qubits. Um, if we were to look at just some region that is um, log to the seventh n, then we're guaranteed that uh, log n of these slices will satisfy this heavy property. Right. And uh, this um, essentially is saying that these states will be close to product states, but that's something that still has to be proved later. All right, so um, for slices in K-heavy, uh, we're now going to consider producing the projectors onto leading Schmidt coefficients. Uh, so this would be um, W1 and B1 um, via geometrically local shell of the quantum circuits. It turns out we can do this um, using the technique of a black encoding. Um, I'm not going to go through this lemma um, at all. I think um, the important takeaway is that we have, um, we can consider the part of the state psi b union f that lies on just one half. Um, so for instance, um, on the f part, um, and we consider taking powers of this. And it turns out that there is a geometrically local shale depth quantum circuit, which uh, will produce this rho f to the k state after post-selection. Um, this slide, like I said, I'm not going to talk about this much. Uh, the more important part, is we can use these uh, geometrically local shallow depth quantum circuits to define operators um, p f sub i to the k and p b sub i to the k. And these operators are inverse polynomially close to projectors onto the leading Schmidt coefficient. Uh, so this lemma is showing that we can in fact produce, um, or we can project onto leading Schmidt coefficients um, at heavy slices in particular. Um, I have this note here, um, K is the number of times that the black encoded circuit is applied. Um, the effect of K, I kind of hid in this lemma. Um, I wanna say that this is actually inverse quasi-polynomially close, uh, depending on a particular choice of K, uh, but for ease of this talk, I'm just going to um, say that it's inverse, poly, uh, inverse polynomial. All right. Um, so now from this, uh, we're going to define a new operator, uh, pi f sub i to the k. 
um, which is just those projection, um, approximate projection operators uh, surrounded by these C wraps. Um, it's kind of a strange definition. Uh, the point of which is to look at what happens when we apply a single one of these operators to the circuit C. Uh, so we're going to consider at site I, we choose this um, high operator at I acting on C, and we're going to ask, what does this do to our circuit? Um, so yeah, again, recall, we can uh, break our circuit down into C, B, M, F composed with C, L, and C, R. Right, so this picture here is a sort of uh, representation of what this pi at i acting on c looks like. Uh, so in the bottom here, we have our circuit C, which is decomposed into CL, CR, and CBMF. Uh, we have inverse C wraps. Uh, these gray parallelograms are supposed to represent this approximate projector, and then we reapply C. Uh, first thing to note is that these C wraps ultimately cancel with each other. Uh, and then lastly, these projectors, um, um, I didn't go into the definition very much, but they only affect the B and the F registers, um, which means that the uh, state on L can be moved up past this projector and so can the state on R. Uh, so ultimately, uh, the takeaway from these slides is that when we act, with our circuit, or act on our circuit C with this pi I operator, uh, what we get out is the C, L, and C, R are left untouched and we have this approximate projector applied to CBMF. All right, uh, are there any questions about this operator and what it does? All right, so now I'm gonna get into the more technical, uh, the technical portion, uh, which is this linear combination lemma for our paper. Um, so first, I'm going to let uh, sigma denote a set of slices. Um, so this is like kind of heavy notation, but the sigma is just going to um, give you indices for where you're going to apply pi operators. Uh, and we'll define a state based on the sigma, um, which is I'll call uh, psi sigma. Uh, psi sigma, again, it is the circuit C uh, prepared on the L0 state. Um, there's these post selections on the M registers, and then we're going to apply every pi operator indexed by our set sigma. Um, so the lemma that we have says consider a set of heavy slices, um, then any subset delta of these slices, uh, we have the following. We have that the psi uh, empty set state is inverse polynomially close to the linear combination. Um, of we're going to sum over all possible subsets of slices um, and we're going to weigh them uh, accordingly with these minus signs. Um, and over here on the left, we can see if we were to just move this minus sign inside, uh, we could just uh, represent this entire quantity as just the sum over the entire path of set. Um, why is this interesting? Uh, well, note that if we were to post select the psi empty set state on zero, we exactly recover the quantity that we're looking for, the output probability on the zero state. Uh, so what this lemma is effectively saying is that the output probability on, uh, of the L0 state can be approximated by a summation over similar quantities. All right, and I'll go into the proof of this. Um, for starters, I'm going to use this notation uh, rho of A uh, all this is, is the density matrix uh, representing the state prepared by A on the zero register. Um, it, it's unfortunate that I have to introduce this notation because it makes things look kind of confusing. Uh, the reason I do so is because it saves a lot of space. Um, so yeah, the, the way to intuitively think about this is that it is these, uh, the circuit A preparing um, prepared on the all zero state. So in terms of this notation, this previous quantity I mentioned, the sum over all the subset sigma uh, can be written as um, the state prepared by the pi operators of a particular subset, um, post-selecting on all of the Ms and then acting on C. Uh, first, we're gonna consider bounding this uh, quantity without post-selection. Uh, so that is uh, the sum over all subsets where we apply every pi operator in a subset to C and we prepare the state from that circuit. Um, so recall for one slice, 
Um, I said that we can decompose a circuit into CBMF and CL and R. And for two slices, we can compose the circuit as um, both CBMFs and then the remaining gates. And this is the general trend. Uh, for any subset of uh, slices sigma, we can rewrite our circuit C as the tensor product over all the CBMFs in this subset sigma, uh, and then composed with all the remaining gates, which is all this is saying. Um, so remember the pictorial image that I had, um, and what it said was a pi operator on site I, the way it acts on this is it leaves CL and CR alone and it applies this approximate projector to CBMF. And so when we take our quantity that we had on the previous slide, we see that this tensor product over all of the slices in sigma uh, leaves all of these leftover gates alone and it applies this approximate projector to CBMF. Um, are there any questions up to this point? Um, so now uh, it turns out um, we can rewrite this state. Um, it looks kind of horrible at the moment, but it can be simplified quite nicely. Um, so I'm going to just consider a small example if delta were two. Uh, in this case, the power set over the elements one and two is the empty set, the set that contains just one, the set that contains just two and um, both one and two. Um, so writing this summation out in this small example, uh, we see that the empty set is the state prepared by circuit C on the L0 state, uh, minus the state prepared by this C, L, C, R, and approximate projector on CBMF1, uh, minus the same state, but now with the approximate projector on CBMF2, and then lastly, plus the um, state with approximate projectors applied on both CBMFs. Um, we can expand a lot of these terms um, as before. Uh, so C can be expanded into CBMF, uh, both CBMFs, and then all of the remaining gates. Um, in the second sum, C1R can be decomposed into CBMF on two and C12 and 2R, uh, and likewise for the remainder of these. Uh, the important thing to notice is that each of these is a state. Um, there's uh, each of them comes with a coefficient, adding and subtracting them. Um, but note that the state that is prepared by them always contains this quantity L1, 1, 2, 2 R. So the first thing we can do is actually just pull this circuit out from every single um, every single term. So in this case, we have the circuit, uh, the remaining circuits not in the CBMFs, uh, conjugating this um, summation which is the state prepared by CBMF, uh, both places, minus the state prepared by the approximate projected version of one with the other, um, the CBMF one with the approximate projected version of CBMF two, and then lastly, both approximate projectors. All right, and then hopefully you can see, we can actually rewrite this middle summation as a tensor product. Um, we're going to have the tensor product over um, one and two, of the state prepared by CBMF minus the state prepared by this projected, approximate projected version of CBMF. Um, and you can see this by just uh, doing out the tensor product. Uh, any questions up to this point? Okay. All right, so in general, I proved this for delta equals two, but the same uh, method holds for any choice of delta. Uh, we have all of the state or all of the circuits not contained in CBMFs, um, conjugating this tensor product over the states prepared on CBMF minus the state prepared by the approximate projected version. Um, and then just using properties of the trace norm, uh, we see that these circuits are unitary, they don't affect the norm. And this tensor product um, can be taken outside as a product over all of these. Um, so ultimately, um, I think I have it on the next slide. Um, to sum up to this point, the quantity that we were originally trying to bound, which is this sum over all of the subsets of the states prepared by the pi operators acting on each slice in the subset on C, um, the, the norm quantity is exactly the same as the product over every slice 
of this difference between these two states. Right. Uh, and since these p and pi operators at trivially on each m register, our previous work holds even under post-selection on m. Um, so we have this quantity, which is exactly the quantity in the lemma, is equal to uh, the same quantity we had in the previous slide, but now with post-selection. Uh, turns out we can bound each of the terms in the above product uh, by an inverse poly logarithm, uh, in inverse poly logarithmically. Um, the intuition behind this, uh, we said that we're looking at heavy slices. Um, so the top Schmidt coefficient is uh, inverse poly inverse poly logarithmically close to one. Uh, and then now this um, approximate projector is inverse poly logarithmically close to the actual projector. Uh, and so together we see that the state prepared um, and then post-selected is um, also inverse poly logarithmically close to the state prepared and then approximately projected. Uh, so ultimately just summing this all up together, we had our original quantity, which is the sum over these psi sigma states can be represented in this notation with these rows uh, and eventually can be upper bounded by one over log to the fourth n to the power of delta. Uh, and if we choose delta to be log n, then this is bounded by an inverse polynomial. And so this completes the proof of the lemma. Um, no, I said um, choose delta equals to log n. Um, we started off by looking at a region of size log to the seventh n, and we saw the lemma previously guaranteed that we could find um, log n of these slices in that region. Um, so are there any questions about the proof? So just one naive question. Um, so if you're taking delta to be log n, does that mean the number of terms in that summation that you're looking at, it, it's roughly n? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, yeah, so on the next slide, um, there's a important problem here. Um, important problem being that these states are produced by circuits on all n qubits. Um, and now we also have, like you said, the sum over n terms. Um, and so this is a problem for divide and conquer. Uh, specifically, um, we want to produce a, um, states that are on smaller circuits, not on circuits on the whole thing. Uh, it turns out this isn't really a problem. Um, and it's exactly to do with uh, all these projector lemmas and the fact that the leading Schmidt coefficients are um, poly inverse poly logarithmically close to one. Um, so we let, um, recall this is what our psi sigma state is. It's these, uh, all of the pi operators in the subset sigma acting on the circuit. Um, we can consider just one of these slices. So the pi operator acting on um, C all, it turns out um, for, from the same uh, lemmas we had before that this is in fact inverse poly logarithmically close to a product state across the cup. Um, and these product states are produced using CBMF, pi k and CLJ. Um, remember all of these were geometrically local and shallow depth. Uh, so these states um, sigma can also be produced in uh, a geometrically local and shallow depth way. Um, in particular, if we consider slices towards the middle of the 1D line of qubits, then each of these uh, quantities is produced by a state on approximately half the original number of qubits. All right. Um, okay, so again, uh, given a 1D geometrically local quantum circuit, we are trying to approximate this output probability via this uh, linear combination of states. Um, so the idea here, uh, it turns out, um, given delta heavy slices from a region of log to the seventh n, we can construct delta squared new quantum circuits. Um, these each have properties that they are 1D geometrically local and shallow depth. Um, delta of these circuits act on at most three quarters n qubits. Uh, so note that that is a constant fraction smaller than the original. Uh, the remaining delta squared act on at most log to the seventh n qubits. Uh, and then these quantities, the output probabilities of these smaller circuits can be used to approximate uh, this summation. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Um, it, it turns out that we only need to calculate uh, delta squared quantities and then sum them up together. 
Um, okay. Are there any questions on these couple slides? Okay. So pretty much just wrapping up here. Um, you'll note that the whole time I was, um, I, I used the phrase 1D geometrically local and shale adapt. Um, there's really no reason for this. Um, so in this case, we say C is a 3D geometrically local quantum circuit. Um, we're going to now, instead of, um, we're going to consider performing division just along a single dimension of the cube. Um, so in this case, uh, the cube is three dimensional, but we're looking at dividing along this um, X axis. Um, so the first step is going to be find delta heavy slices from the middle log to the seventh N of the cube. Uh, we could do this by the lemma that I had um, towards the beginning of the presentation. Um, we're going to construct our new um, delta squared um, circuits. We are going to recursively approximate the output probabilities for the circuits that have uh, a constant um, fraction of the original. We are going to use the 2D algorithm from uh, BGM to approximate the quantities for the remaining circuits, which have only width log to the seventh. Uh, and then we're going to combine these solutions to approximate the final quantity. And so this is the essence of a single divide and conquer step of our 3D algorithm. Um, so some things to note, uh, the algorithm in the paper has a lot of parameters, uh, depth of recursion, black encoding power, um, several more I don't think I mentioned in this talk. Um, and they all interplay in, um, in interesting ways. Um, so we saw each of them show up in the approximation error. Um, so that was one approximating our original quantity with the psi sigma states, and then two approximating these psi sigma states with product states. Um, but each of the parameters also shows up, of course, in the runtime analysis, uh, and typically we work in opposite ways. So it turns out that the parameters can be chosen so that the runtime of the algorithm is quasi-polynomial uh, and the error is inverse polynomial. Uh, and like I said, the description of this can be found in the paper. Um, it's recursive analysis. I wouldn't say it's standard analysis um, since there are, we're dividing it delta slices and not some uh, constant number, um, but yeah. So some open problems. Uh, related to this is to improve to uh, improve the algorithm polynomial time. Um, it it seems like it might not be possible, at least with the way the algorithm is currently stated. Um, there are some uh, problems that come with um, specifically in the base case algorithm. Uh, even if you consider constant depth circuits, so not poly logarithmic, um, we still ultimately need to use the base case algorithm in a poly logarithmic depth circuit. Uh, this has to do with those projector operators. Um, but that's not to say that there couldn't be changes made to the algorithm or adjustments to fix this. Um, another open problem is to recursively approximate output probabilities of any d-dimensional geometrically local circuit. Um, so you could imagine we started with a divide and conquer algorithm on three dimensions, with the base case being the 2D algorithm by Bravia, Gasset, and Movisaw. But we could also consider maybe a 4D geometrically local circuit um, and then divide and conquer and use the 3D algorithm as, as the base case and then continue onwards. Uh, Matt worked with some RU students and it seems like this second problem is solved. Um, another thing, we could consider circuits that are low depth but not necessarily geometrically local. Um, this seems to be quite a difficult problem. Uh, in particular, um, our methods with these light cone separations uh, don't really apply to the case of non-geometric locality. Um, the, the correlations spread um, pretty far in a circuit that are not geometrically local. Uh, and lastly, uh, another problem could be to consider again the task of simulating this classical or this low depth geometrically local quantum circuit combined with classical post-processing and ask the question if we can estimate the output bit uh, of this algorithm is another open problem. All right, and that's actually all I have in the talk. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now.